Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love you have shown us in Christ Jesus. As we come to your word this morning, quiet our minds, still our hearts, so that we hear your word, that it takes root, that renews us and transforms us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've been thinking a lot about family this week. Family. So uh, I uh, came across some pictures, coincidentally, of my family. They were on my computer. I was going through files. And so the first one that you see in the far uh, left-hand corner is of my dad. And then my two older sisters, twins, and me. I'm guessing, what do you think, maybe two, three years old at the most? Something like that. And then in White Bear Lake, yes, it snowed there when we, we were living there. There was snow. And there are four, um, four of my sisters. One, two, three, four. I actually have five sisters, though. One was still yet to be, I think, when that picture was taken. And then we had a pop-up camper. Anybody else have a pop-up camper? Yeah, not, not too many. Okay, so we traveled around and went to camping. Family, though. It stirs up of a lot of emotions, especially when I was going through all of these old pictures. And for a lot of people, the emotions of family can be very good and heartwarming. But for some people, they can also leave a taste of bitterness. For some people, families are a safe haven. For some people, families are a place of hurt. But most of us, for the most part, we fall somewhere in between there. I mean, there's a little bit of craziness in all of our families, isn't there? One author said this, unknown author, but I loved it. He said, insanity does not run in my family. Rather, it strolls through, taking time to get to know everyone personally. Yet, family, right? We always say it's all about family. Blood is thicker than water. And so we kind of place our family, our definition family, on blood, right? But have you ever stopped to take a moment and think, how do you define family? I mean, we just kind of assume that. So if I were to ask you how you define family, what would you answer? And by the way, there are sermon notes for everybody, and it's a good question. How do you define family? It's a question that really doesn't get asked much. And another question that doesn't really get asked much is, what is God's design for family? You see, just as last week we talked about God's design for marriage, God has a design for family as well. And when that design for family is followed, there's greater unity, harmony, and love. So this morning, we're going to explore God's design for family. And we're going to start with our reading from Ephesians. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So just like last week, we're in Ephesians and Paul was writing about marriage. Now he's writing about family and he references a commandment. Right? This would actually go back to the Ten Commandments. And what do the Ten Commandments teach us? The first three commandments teach us one thing, how to love God. And the other commandments teach us how to love our neighbor. But it is the love of God that is first and foremost. And these commandments are reiterated over and over again they were re reiterated in Deuteronomy. And so our reading from today from Deuteronomy is called the Shema, which means here. That's what here is in Hebrew, Shema. Shema, O Israel. But it says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord with you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. It all starts first and foremost with the love of God. 
And so we never want to assume how family starts. Family actually starts with the love of God. The love of God is the foundation for the family. Just as we saw last week, the foundation for marriage was the love of God for us in Christ Jesus, and thus husbands and wives are to love each other that way. Now we have the foundation for family in the love of God. Now I can tell you, most people don't think about the foundation of family this way at all. As a matter of fact, the premarital counseling that I've done and marriage counseling that I've done, people don't even think about family. You want to know how we define family? It's from the nursery, nursery rhyme. You know this one. Johnny and Susie sitting in the tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Mary in the baby carriage. Right? That's our paradigm for family. But that foundation is an unsure foundation. The foundation that has to come first is the love of God. You see, you want to know, the design for family is first found in the nature of God himself. And that nature is one of spirit. The nature is one of love. So when you start to base your foundation of family on that first, you have a sure foundation. But notice that in the commandment, we are to love in a certain way. We are to honor our parents. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for that is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Honor is not a word we use too much nowadays in our society. And it's not used much in family at all. So what does honor actually mean? The word honor in Hebrew means heavy or weighty. In the Old Testament, the word uh, honor is used, that weight or heaviness is used for the glory of God. Talks about his divine majesty in that respect. Therefore, to honor one's parents is to give due weight to their position. They are, we are to give due weight to our parents because of their God-given authority. Martin Luther in the large catechism says this. He says, God has given this walk of life, fatherhood and motherhood, a special position of honor, higher than that of any other walk of life under it. Not only has he commanded us to love our parents, but to honor them. In regards to brothers and sisters and neighbors in general, he commands nothing higher than we love them. But he distinguishes father and mother above all persons on the earth, places them next to himself, for it is a much higher thing to honor than to love. Honor includes not only love, but also deference, humility, modesty directed, so to speak, towards a majesty concealed within them. This is a very different way to think about honor, isn't it? We think about honor as just obeying, and that's certainly part of it, but there is a much greater depth to it here. When you ponder those words, it starts to actually make you stand up a little bit. Because honor, and certainly honor of parents, is not something you find in our society much at all anymore. As a matter of fact, God's design for family flies in the face now of what culture says. Youth is glorified on TV, right? Youth is glorified on TV, and old age is something to be avoided. On TV and in movies, by the way, who are the smart people? The kids. And the parents are often seen as maybe loving, but kind of bumbling and out of it, especially fathers. Fathers are degraded quite a bit. But by the way, you never want to be a mother in a Disney movie, because they kill you off pretty fast. Bambi, Finding Nemo, The Little Mermaid, The Lion King too. is The Lion King, the mom die there? I, I mean, really. So honoring a parents is not something in our culture. 
but it's even more than that. See, when you go against God's design for family, society starts to fall apart. Just as I talked about how if you want to destroy a society, you destroy marriage, you also destroy honoring in family and honoring of parents. And here's what happens. If there is no honor of parents, two things happen. On one side, you get basically anarchy, lawlessness. So things running wild. But on the other side, there's a void, right? There's a void where that honor is supposed to be. So what fills the void? Generally, you find that people in power and government starts to fill that void. And you can find this throughout history and certainly in our current day and age in which government says, we decide now what is right for the family. And you get totalitarianism. So lawlessness or totalitarianism, take your pick. Both are not God's design. Yeah, but some people might say, look, you don't know my parents. My parents drive me nuts. Right? Again, that little bit of craziness that we have. Can we then just say, well, I don't get to honor them? Can we just say, too bad? Let's uh, go back to Luther here for a moment. He wrote, it must therefore be impressed upon young people that they revere their parents as God's representatives and to remember that however lowly, poor, feeble, and eccentric they may be, okay, <laughs> that's parents, however lowly, poor, feeble, and eccentric they may be, they are still their fathers and mothers given by God. They are not to be deprived of their honor because of their ways or failings. Therefore, we are not to think of their persons, whatever they may be, but of the will of God, who has created and ordained it so. So therefore, parents are to be honored because they are a gift given by God. Parents are part of God's grand design. And when parents are honored, when there is actually honor in the family, the promise goes with this commandment that it will go well for them in that land. There's a promise there with God's design for family. And the promise is this, that it will go well with you. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have difficult times. It doesn't mean that there's going to be heartache or that there won't be heartache or sorrow, but that there's a quality of life, a solidity, a peace that comes there. If you want to build a society that flourishes, have this commandment, be part of the society. Now, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, this is include everybody, we are to teach our children. So in our society, we just assume that things are going to get soaked in by osmosis. But God knows that we need to be taught and we need to teach. From our reading today, you shall teach them diligently, your children, and shall talk of them when you sit and talk of them, so the commandments, and talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. So we are to teach, and there are three ways we are supposed to teach. By example and habit, by repetition, and by reasoning. By example and habit. How do you worship in your home? We think it's often worship here at church, but how do you worship in your home? See, my father, as much as he loved us, and there was no doubt that he loved us greatly, didn't teach me about faith. Actually, you know what he taught me about faith? Go to church every Sunday, do the holy days of obligation, be a good Catholic. That's how I was raised, Catholic. But you could put any, any denomination in there. You could put, be a good Baptist, be a good whatever. And so I learned from my father that faith was an obligation. That's what I learned. That's the example he taught. Did we ever read the Bible at home? No. Did we ever pray together other than at dinner? Never. 
We didn't do that as a family. So for me, faith was just an obligation. The other is by repetition. You know, you and I need to repeat stuff. If you've been in Bible study with me, we've been going over the New Testament, right? And I've got a whole story, and we repeat that story to understand the books of the, old, of the New Testament. And I do that again and again because we need that. So if you and I need that, our youth, our children need that as well. And also reasoning. I think this is where we fail the most as a church in America. We do not understand the reasons for our faith. If I were to ask my father about something, he would just say, because. Well, which is a, a right, that's a, a dad thing, because. I like that one myself. But because, but that's not sufficient for our faith and forming of our faith. We need to understand what our faith is and to be able to give a testimony to regarding our faith. Although Peter didn't write this specifically about families, I think it applies. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Always be prepared. So, We've got these three things, example and habit, repetition, and reasoning. I know some of you are thinking, look, I don't have young kids. My kids are grown now. They're adults. So let me ask you a question. If you're thinking this right now, when did you stop being a parent? Never, right? So this might be new to you today the responsibility of teaching. And if it's new, you still have an opportunity because you are a parent till your very last breath, right? So you have an opportunity to think, wow, how am I worshiping with my children? How am I praying with them? How am I encouraging them in their faith? And by the way, it might come to it that your children might have to encourage you. I know I and one of my sisters who are strong in faith actually witnessed to my father who needed that. Just as we heard testimony this morning that families come to faith because of their children. And by the way, you might be thinking, okay, well, children, fine. How many of you are grandparents? I know your grandparents, right? Grandparents also play an important part in all of this. Paul, who is writing to Timothy, his protege Timothy, he said, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. The faith you have to give to your grandchildren is immense. I came across a woman, Lillian Penner, who wrote about her oldest granddaughter who sent her a note. It says this, Grandma, your phone calls, cards, and emails were encouraging and made a significant impact on my life, especially in my teenage and college years. Your prayers and encouragement have been rock-solid reminders of God's truth and my incredible crazy life-shaping years, and now in my married life, your prayers help me to surrender the craziness of my life to God. That's because of a grandparent. So if you are a grandparent, how can you share faith with your grandchildren? And by the way, even if you're not a grandparent, you might be an aunt or uncle. Aunts and uncles also have a significant role to play in the shaping of nieces and nephews. And although there's not one specific chapter, a whole chapter, just about the role of aunts or uncles in Scripture, there are many, many examples throughout. If you want, just read about Abraham, who mentored and helped Lot. 
These are all examples. I'm hoping you can understand. We started with what we call, would call the nuclear biological family now, but it's kind of expanding out of that, isn't it? And now what you need to understand is God's design for family is larger than you ever think. For that, we are going to go to our gospel reading from today. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus has been speaking. Apparently he's inside. Uh, perhaps a larger crowd has been around there. And when he's told, hey, your, your brothers and your, your mom, they're outside. Uh, they want to talk to you. He says this wonderful question. Who's my mother? Who are my brothers? Because it's a different idea of who we are. So let me ask you a question. I asked this, uh, I think, it was either Wednesday or Thursday night. Uh, it must have been um, Thursday night Bible study. Am I your brother? I'm asking that as a real question. I'm looking for a response. <laughs> Am I your brother? It's kind of a tepid response though, right? We kind of know we're supposed to say that. It's the churchy thing to do that he's my brother or she's my sister, but we feel very uncomfortable with it, don't we? I mean, we're like we're supposed to. We know it says brother, sister in the Bible, but it's like, you know, are we supposed to be like King James? Fare thee well, brother, good to see you. Is it supposed to be like that? Or are we supposed to be the Pentecostal brother, sister, and it'd be like a revival of some sort, which is really weird if you're Lutheran. Like, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> but brother or sister, and what makes us a family? See, what is God's design for his family? And it is this. Because of the blood of Christ and his cross, you and I are related to him in faith. Because of Christ and his cross and the blood that he has shed, you and I are brothers and sisters because of faith in him. Are we related by blood? Yes, we are. It is the blood of the new covenant in Christ Jesus. That is how you and I our brothers and sisters. And it does not happen because of us, it happens because of God. First uh, John chapter one, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In Christ Jesus, you are a child of God, because of faith in him. And thus we are all family. Paul writes about this, Galatians chapter four. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our heart, crying, Abba, Father. Just as we can cry, Abba, Father, because of Christ Jesus, we can say, brother and sister, wholeheartedly, you are my family. You are my family. Let me give you an example of this. So when I was first in seminary, we had to go take a, uh, we had to go to a different church, different denomination to see how other people worshiped. And uh, we lived in St. Paul and very close to our home was the church that you see on the screen. It is the church, the redeemed Christian church of God. I, had, I didn't know anything about it really, 
Uh, it's Pentecostal church uh, based from Nigeria. But I went and I walked in. I was the only white person there. About 250 people. Everybody knew I was a visitor. <laughs> there was no question whatsoever. But you know what? I didn't feel out of place. Why? Because I was with brothers and sisters. Now, at this particular church, they don't do infant baptism. They do infant dedication. And it was this beautiful ceremony where the mother and father, both dressed in white, holding, I think their son, would proceed up to the front of the church. And everybody in the congregation filled in following them. Beautiful ceremony. And then after that, they said, do you want to come to the reception? Right? Here's this white guy visitor. And I said, sure. And so I went to the reception. And it was amazing because I ended up sitting at the table where the grandparents sat. And here's what happened. Everybody came up and gave their respects to the grandparents. Because that church, as part of their statement of faith, says we honor parents. Isn't that amazing? So you and I are brothers and sisters together in Christ, and we are because of the blood of Christ. God designed his family, and it's based on his nature. It is love, humility, and honor made manifest to us in the cross of Christ. And though it is through Christ and his cross and faith in him, you and I are brought into the full family of God. And therefore, we must cherish family and protect family and uphold the love and honor of family here and everywhere we go. So this morning, a couple questions for you. How does the love of God, the honor of parents, and the blood of Christ shape your family? Look, if you only asked and worked through that one question together as a family, it would pay great, great dividends. The other question is, when will you sit down and talk about family from God's design? And how will you share your faith by example, habit, repetition, and reasoning? Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us, for your design of family. We ask that we are guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live in Christ Jesus, in your design, in your love, always giving honor and praise to you, Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hope that you've been blessed by this message. If you have any questions or you would like to grow deeper in your faith, please visit our website at joyccc.com. Again, that's joyccc.com.